are going on the news during the week. You told me that Christmas Eve was the most likely time for a person to die of a heart attack. Cheerful, aren't I? <laughs> Apparently it was due to the stress of Christmas. As I have never sent a Christmas card to anyone, or bought anyone a Christmas present in my life, I figure I will probably survive. <laughs> So I don't know why I'm behind the pulpit on the day like today. Because it's not Christmas Eve. True. This morning I just want to reflect. Because the message of Christmas flies seamlessly through to the message of Easter. And everything that I want to say this morning will be on the data up there with a the chronic back problem. I didn't know whether I was going to make it, so I will read it through. I think most of it has actually been said either in song, but let us reflect on it. The Christ message as I prefer to pronounce it. Rejoicing in Jesus. It's a time of reflection, of rejoicing, and praise and worship. And more than that, let us marvel at how the great big creator became our saviour. Isaiah 7.14 has already been read. It was prophesied in 740 BC. Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and shall call his name Emmanuel. Emmanuel meaning God is with us. It is a title, if you like, or a Hebrew characterization, not a daily name by which he was called. The names of the Lord spoke to Joseph and said, She will bring forth a son, and you will call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. And so we know him as Jesus rather than Emmanuel. But let us never forget the meaning of that, that God is with us. In Hebrew, Joshua, in Greek, Jesus, meaning God is Saviour. If Emmanuel is with us, God is with us. I want to touch just for a minute on the message of the Incarnation in Philippians 2, 5 to 8. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal of God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even to the death of a cross. And there's that seamless flow. And thanks, Linda, for all your hard work and trying to keep up with me. Jesus did not think equality of God was something he had to hang on to at all costs when he became a man, because he always was and always would be God. Some translations say he emptied himself. And it's not a wrong translation, but in English we don't quite get the right meaning. You can empty a bucket of water and it's empty. A bit of H2O sticks to the sides, doesn't it? But there's nothing in the bucket. But that was not the case when Jesus became the man. Colossians 1.19 and particularly 2.9 declares that in him, that is Jesus, all the fullness of the Godhead, was pleased to dwell in bodily form. All the fullness of the Godhead in bodily form. And Hebrews 1.3 describes Jesus as being the brightness of God's glory and the express image of his person. But God dwells in unapproachable light, as it says in 1 Timothy 6.16, 6, so it would have been pointless for Jesus to appear as he was from eternity past. There's no man to come near him or approach him. Just ask Saul of Tarsus, known as Paul, who was struck blind when he saw Jesus in all his glory. Of necessity, the glory and greatness of Jesus as God had to be veiled. And that word was in one of the, hint, the choruses we sang. So that he could make God known to sinful man. 
He didn't come down and demonstrate his deity all the time. There were times when he healed someone, he told them not to tell anyone about it. And if you read it, you'll find they took no notice, they were so excited, they went around and told everybody anyway. But he was not there just to put on a demonstration and have people follow him for that reason. He wanted them to follow him for the right and the true reason. As a man, Jesus prayed to his Father. As a man, Jesus said, My Father is greater than I. But still as a man, Jesus declares in John 17, I and the Father are one. He raised the dead, he forgave sins, which only God could do. The man, Christ Jesus, was at all times fully man and fully God. Not part man and part God, but fully man and fully God. We go to Isaiah 9, 6 to 7, and we'll only look at these very briefly, thanks Linda. It says it was written in 740 BC, for unto us a child is born. Of course, that's a prophecy relating to Jesus. Unto us the Son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulder, and his name will be called Wonderful, <coughs> Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, and Prince of Peace. And the rest of the verse relates to the future events. You know, the Mormons and the JWs, John referred to it. They don't like this verse. The mighty God and the everlasting Father. Jesus taught his disciples to pray, Our Father who art in heaven. And yet one of these titles or Hebrew characteristics was that he was the everlasting Father. Micah 5.2, written in 710 BC, says, But you, Bethlehem, Ephrata, though you are little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of you shall come forth to me the one to be ruler in Israel whose goings are forth, are from old, from everlasting. Zechariah 9, 9, you don't have to put that up if you don't want to remember, but it's just a reference which I want to touch on briefly because it explains the character of who he was as he came. Rejoice greatly, and that's what we want to do this morning is rejoice. Here it's the Jews, O daughter of Zion, shouting triumph, O daughter of Jerusalem, behold your king is coming to you. He came as a baby, yes, but he was a king. The king was in the very midst of the nation of Israel. He is just and endowed salvation, lowly and mounted on a donkey, even on a colt, the foal of a donkey. And we see that fulfilled as they rejoiced. And yet the rejoicing wasn't sincere. Those very same voices soon after are crying, away with him, away with him. We will not have this man reign over us. And John referred to that last week in John 1. He came to his own and his own did not receive him, but to as many as received him, believing in his name. So then he gave them the right to be called children of God. I trust we are all children of God this morning through believing in Jesus the one who was met God with us. The birth of Jesus was announced in Luke 1, 30-33. Then the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favour with God, and behold, you will conceive in your womb, and bring forth a son, and shall call his name Jesus. He will be great, and be called the Son of the Highest, and the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. We see these prophecies, you'll find most of them in the midst of a graphic description of the second advent of Christ and all the things that are going to occur there. And if you look at both sides, unless you're an end time specialist, you might not understand it. But how precious it is to see these glimpses in the Old Testament, fulfilled literally through Jesus Christ our Lord. Luke 1, 39 to 45, and I love this. Two women and two unborn babies. Mary of Jesus in the womb visits Elizabeth, who is herself carrying John the Baptist in her womb. Now Mary arose in those days and went into the hill country of haste to a city of Judah and entered the house of Zacharias and greeted Elizabeth. And it happened when Elizabeth heard the greeting of Mary that the babe leapt in her womb. All the mothers here can identify with this. As a mere male, I only know a little bit about it. And Elizabeth was full of the Holy Spirit, and she spoke with a loud voice and said, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. 
But why is this granted to me that the mother of my Lord should come to me? For indeed, as soon as the voice of your breathing in my ears, the babe leapt in my womb, there's the same thing again, but then it gives the reason. The babe leapt in my womb for joy. Blessed is she who believed, for there will be a fulfillment of these things which are told her by the Lord. There is another reference to John the Baptist rejoicing just before King Herod chopped his head off. It's in John 3, 29. It says, He who has the bride is the bridegroom. And speaking of himself, he says, But the friend of the bridegroom who stands and hears him rejoices greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. Therefore this joy of mine is fulfilled. Why did John the Baptist speak about Jesus as a bridegroom? Well, there's two references in Isaiah 61 and 62, prophetically speaking of Jesus. I believe there is a yet future fulfillment. He saw Jesus and rejoiced greatly, and yet there was more rejoicing to come for John the Baptist, but we won't go into that this morning. I've written this and titled it, Marvel at This. Ron spoke about this two weeks ago. Jesus, the eternal Son of God and the creator of the universe, conceived by the Holy Spirit, began life as we do, a few cells growing in the womb, utterly dependent upon his mother, ruining her figure, or the baby bump as we looked at the Bible study of Ron the other day, a bit more modern language. Causing morning sickness, but imagine the rejoicing when Mary felt the no pain moved for the first time. The discomfort caused as he approached full term. The pain of childbirth. Not that I don't know much about any of this, but the rejoicing when he was born. He fed at Mary's breast. His nappies were changed. The good old cloth ones with the pins that just stick into the baby. I mean the nappy. <laughs> That's why kids uh, need toughening up these days, because they don't get that early experience. <laughs> Something like that, anyway. <laughs> But rejoicing when he started crawling and moved for the first book for the first time, playing with his half siblings, helping or hindering Joseph make furniture. He went to the temple age 12, but he emphasised that he knew about what his father's business was to be. He became a teenager, a full grown man, yet we know nothing of this period until his public ministry began age 30, which is the age at which Jewish priests began to serve. Marvel at the fact that Jesus created Eve. Remember, Jesus is the co-creator of the universe. John 1, Colossians 1, Hebrews 1, and many other places. He created Eve in her womb from Adam's rib. He knew of the full knowledge of God himself that he would enter into the womb of one of her descendants. Marvel also at the greatness of his love, for he did all this in love for you. Yes you and me. I can't understand it. This is too high for my knowledge as a mere man. I can understand the triune nature of God fairly well. In 13 years of teaching high school students, they can understand the concept. But I just absolutely marvel at this principle of being fully God and fully human. And Jesus in the womb, leap, John the Baptist, leaping with joy. It's totally beyond my comprehension, but we can rejoice in it and marvel in it and praise and worship him this morning. If I was God, I was going to say that, but it sounds just absolutely terrible. If I was merely, as a mere fallible man, somehow I would have skipped most, if not all of this. Wouldn't send him down just to live that three years of public ministry and then die on the cross be sufficient. Of course he must be sinless. And that is the reason why he went through all of this. Hebrews 4.15, for we did not have a high priest who cannot sympathise with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted or tested as we are, yet without sin. Three crucial words. For had he ever sinned or yet to the temptation of sin, his death on the cross would have been for nothing. But infirmities or weaknesses, whether physical or moral, no temper tantrums. We've got a two-year-old granddaughter, and she sure knows how to throw a temper tantrum. No teenage rebellion, been there, done that herself, unfortunately. He must 
be without sin and complete totality to be an acceptable sacrifice to a sin-hating God. And as conceived by the Holy Spirit, he had no sinful nature. Mary's response is wonderful in Luke 1, 46-48. My soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit has rejoiced in God my Saviour. For he has regarded the lowly state of his maidservant. For behold, henceforth all generations will call me blessed. And it's good to follow Mary throughout the New Testament. Remember she held all these things in her heart. And I try and imagine what was going through her mind. I can't possibly imagine what was going through her mind when she stood at the foot of the cross and saw Jesus being nailed to that cross. But she made nothing of herself. My soul does magnify the Lord. And she played an important role in supporting Jesus and his ministry. Jesus is born. She brought forth the firstborn son, wrapped him in a swaddling cloth, and laid him in a manger or a cattle trough, feeding trough. There was no room at the inn. A petty house suite in Herod's palace would have been my way of doing things, but my way is not God's way. His ways and thoughts are higher than us. Isaiah says so. The shepherds visit Jesus. We read that this morning, so we won't go right through it. But there was glad tidings of great joy. And suddenly there was an angel and a multitude of a heavenly host praising God and saying, Glory to God on the highest and on earth peace, goodwill towards men. Heavenly rejoicing and worship go together. As it's heavenly worship, rejoicing and worship, that's what we've been engaged in this morning. The shepherds went home. I wonder if they knew that that little baby they saw in that manger was not only the good shepherd, but the great shepherd and the chief shepherd. These earthly shepherds took care of their flock. They found pasture for them, led them to still waters to drink. And at night, the shepherd would sleep in the door of the sheepfold to protect them from all danger. How much more does Jesus, who is the good, the great, and the chief shepherd, care for his flock? They glorified and praised God, for they had heard and seen of the heavenly shepherd, who was Emmanuel, God with us. The th wise men, I nearly said three, we're not told that, but it's commonly put that way. For some time later, included in the nativity scene, but bow down and worship Jesus, bearing precious gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And there's meaning in those gifts, though. A gift fit for a king. And Matthew 2 says, When they saw the star, they rejoiced with exceeding great joy. And when they came into the house, they saw the young child, Mary his mother, and fell down and worshipped him. We may not have fallen down this morning, or I've my back condition if I go out the time, I will fall down. And if I do fall down, I'm going to worship him anyway. Or probably keep on talking, knowing me. Christmas, give Jesus the gift of your life, dedicated in loving service to him. We will not be looking at Jesus going to the temple. We know that he knew that he had to be about his father's business. But we are to carry on rejoicing until Jesus comes again. 1 Peter 1, 8 says, speaking of Jesus, though now you do not see him yet believing, you rejoice with joy inexpressible and full of glory. Philippians 4, 4, has been up, rejoice in the Lord always. Again I say rejoice. And Matthew 5, 12, rejoice and be glad for your reward in heaven is great. For in the same way they persecuted the prophets who, who were before you. Can you imagine the rejoicing scenes in heaven when Jesus ascended up into heaven to be go back to the Father, having perfectly fulfilled the work of redemption on the cross of Calvary? What a scene that must have been. But you can rejoice this morning because that will be our eternal abode and that will be our eternal occupation. You can read Revelation 4 and chapter 5 to see more about the rejoicing in heaven. I want to close this morning with an article by Max Lucado. He says in the title of this small talk, he loves to be with the one he loves. And it's speaking about Jesus. Follow their travel? It isn't easy. Then why do we do it? Why cram the trunks and endure the airports? I hate airports. They're terrible. 
You know the answer, we love to be with the ones we love. This time of the year in America, there's terrible strife through storms. They're trying to be with their loved ones, but they can't get there. The four-year-old running at the sidewalk into the arms of grandpa. I love it when my little granddaughter comes running up with a beaming smile and jumps into my arms and knocks me flying just about. <laughs> Poor old granddad. The cup of coffee of mum before the rest of the house awakes. That moment when, for a moment, everyone is quiet as we hold hands around the table and we thank God for family and friends and pumpkin pie in the suits American country. I like it, the pumpkin pies. We love to be with the ones we love. May I remind you, so does God. He loves to be with the ones he loves. How else do you explain what he did? Between him and us there was a distance, a great span, and he couldn't bear it. He couldn't stand it, so he did something about it. It wasn't the distance between earth and heaven, it was the distance created by sin. That wasn't Max Ricardo, that was me, sorry. Before coming to the earth, Christ himself was like God in everything, but he gave up his place of God and made himself nothing. He was born to be a man and become like a servant. Philippians 2, 6, NCV. Why? Why did Jesus travel so far? I was asking myself that question, this is Max Ricardo, when I spotted the squirrels outside my window. A family of black-tailed squirrels had made its home amid the roots of the tree north of my office. We've been neighbours for three years now. They watched me pick the keyboard. I watched them store their nuts and climb the trunk. We're mutually amused. I can watch them all day. Sometimes I do. But I've never considered becoming one of them. The squirrel world holds no appeal for me. Who wants to sleep next to a hairy rodent with beating eyes? No comment from you wise who feel you already do. <laughs> Give up the Rocky Mountains, best fishing weddings and laughter for a hole in the ground and a diet of dirty nuts. Count me out. But count Jesus in. What a world he left. Our classiest mansion could be a tree trunk to him. Those finest cuisine would be walnuts on heaven's table. And the idea of becoming a squirrel with paws and tiny teeth and a fairy tale. It's nothing compared to God becoming a one-celled embryo and entering the womb of Mary. But he did. The God of the universe kicked against the wall of a womb, was born into the poverty of a peasant, and spent his first night in the feed trough of a cow. The word became flesh and lived amongst us. The God of the universe left the glory of heaven and moved into the neighbourhood. Our neighbourhood. Who could have imagined he would do such a thing? Why? He loves to be with the ones he loves. We gathered here this morning and Jesus said, wherever two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst. And that will continue right on until we're pulled home to glory to be with him. John 14, Jesus promised, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, you may be also. I trust this morning you are rejoicing you are praising and worshipping and marvelling at the greatness of the way in which God brought about salvation. I trust you know Jesus Christ as your own personal Saviour and Lord of your life. May it be so for his sake. Amen. Three minutes and ten seconds overtime, right? Sorry. <laughs>